The movement involved some great and courageous people. Aaron Henry, Fannie Lou Hamer, so many people who uh, every day took their lives in their hands to make Mississippi a better place. But they had to have lawyers likewise. We were also, I believe, sent here to help people to help themselves when it came to protection of basic civil rights. Mississippi. It was the worst close of the closed society. Blacks have been shot down in cold blood and their homes burned for demanding the right to vote. There were so many things going on in Mississippi that were bad. There were so many people who were arrested unfairly, in jail unfairly. Oh, the need was so overwhelming. It was when I saw mass arrests and there were three black lawyers and 900,000 black folk. But I uh, sort of said that it was very clear. That got me through law school. Um, and I knew where I'd go. My best friend was Jack Young Jr. and his daddy was Jack Young Sr. And I pretty much grew up in Mr. Young's house. I was there often. And uh, Mr. Young was a lawyer for the NAACP. He represented Jane Meredith. He represented Mega Evers. He represented the Freedom Riders. He was the go-to civil rights lawyer in Mississippi. Archie Brown was probably one of my favorite lawyers. Um, I loved to hear stories. He was a comedian, but above all, he was courageous. And I admired his courage more than um, any lawyer I've ever known. Carsey was not an active practitioner. He was the president of the NAACP. He was mostly active in Jackson with the NAACP. Uh, he was active with the Freedom Riders. I spent a lot of personal time with him and he was a great guy and a lot of fun to be around. The three primary African-American lawyers had the yeoman's responsibility of getting individuals who were locked up, released. Those three men had to have uh, significant courage 
or as you say, to be fearless, to go and represent clients that they'd never met. When I just came to Forest, when I was in school, he had a rape case. Uh, there was this guy, black guy, of course, who was accused of raping a white woman. And they were, the, 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 the white family was just really Forest society. And, and the guy, he was from the, from the county and he was poor. And I just had the courage to uh, represent him. Uh, obviously he did not win, but I remember that day and it was just like it was, it was the best day in my young life then for a black man to stand up and represent another black man when he was accused of raping a white woman. First of all, the University of Old Mississippi did not accept any blacks. So no blacks could go to law school there. But those who graduated from law school there had a free pass, they didn't have to take the bar. I remember my dad said that when he went to take the bar in Jackson, that the blacks had to ride on the freight elevator up to the floor to take the exam, whereas the whites rode on the passenger elevator. So there was even discrimination in which elevator you rode on to take the test. And uh, many blacks, and I believe Jack Young and Carsey Hall were two of those who studied under other lawyers here, you know, in Mississippi before they took the exam, because that's what blacks had to do. There were only two law schools in Mississippi, and one of them was at Ole Miss, and Ole Miss did not permit uh, African Americans to go to law school or any other school at, uh, at the University of Mississippi. And the other one was a, a law school that was owned by a law firm, and that, uh, that school did not uh, accept African Americans uh, for its tutelage and, uh, and didn't do so. Uh, even when I became a lawyer, I was not even allowed to go to their bar review course. And it was it was uh, three or four years later that they allowed uh, black persons to attend that law school, which which was ultimately uh, bought by the uh, Mississippi College and the Mississippi College Law School now. I'm trying not to borrow any money this month, hoping that by the end of the month, things will break for me. As I told you, I've been working on a work miscompensation case, which should have a fee of around $500. However, for the first time since I began to practice, I've run into a case where prejudice and prejudice alone has kept me from being paid. A poor cracker on the commission has refused to okay a settlement for my client which had been agreed upon by a lawyer of an insurance company and myself. Last week, it became apparent what the reason was when he made the mistake of telling someone that that nigger lawyer has no business in the case. When Jack passed the bar, he, he, he hung out his shingle as a, as a lawyer uh, on, on Ferris Street, and he began to practice law. When the NAACP uh, took on school desegregation, uh, it, it began to bring cases uh, throughout the South. Some of the cases that they brought had to do with teachers uh, to get uh, equal pay for, for, for teachers. And when the opportunity came, when these people came uh, to Mississippi and then they needed uh, lawyers, and those lawyers uh, would always have to have local lawyers to be involved in those cases. And Jack and, and Carsey and, and Jess were lawyers who were normally the ones who uh, on the pleadings uh, when a case is filed for school desegregation. And they were working with uh, Constance Baker Motley, they were working with Jack Greenberg, uh, <laughs> they were working with Thurgood Marshall at, at points throughout the, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country. Dear Medgar, 
I am being held by the authority of LaFleur County, Greenwood, Mississippi, on the charge of rape, which involves a white woman, which makes it a racial issue. I have been denied the right to converse with anyone, even the members of my family. I appeal to you gentlemen for the aid of legal counsel because I don't have any funds. Very few people come along like Mega who will put their life on the line every day, and he did that. Uh, he was, uh, he was an inspiration to so many Mississippians and made a huge difference in our state. There were so many things going on in Mississippi that were bad that he had to go and get his arms around and try to correct. And he and Jess and Jack were the people who did that. There were so many people who were arrested unfairly, in jail unfairly, and they called Mega, and Mega called Jack, and Jack called Jess, and that's the way it worked. Sometimes it may come to your mind as to why are we rehashing what has happened here in the state of Mississippi. I heard a history teacher who taught in uh, Lanier High School, and his statement of fact was this. He who knows nothing of the past has little understanding of the present and no conception of the future. There was the hostility uh, in the judiciary uh, against black lawyers. There were only a handful who would actually appear in court, uh, two or three in the, in the 50s. Uh, and uh, certainly those who were not, not only appearing in court, but appearing in court to, to change the system, uh, there was hostility against them. You know, Mac Charles Parker was accused of raping or attempting to rape a, a white woman uh, uh, in that county, and he was arrested for it. And uh, his he and Jess Brown was engaged by his, his mother to represent uh, Mac Charles Parker against that 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 allegation. Who employed you to represent M. C. Parker? Uh, M.C. Parker's mother employed me. In fact, she came to me and employed me to represent him. You weren't employed by the NAACP? No, I was not employed by the NAACP or any other organization, group partnership or anything else other than his mother. How did you feel that you were treated in trying this case in Pearl River County? Well, personally, uh, uh, I tried the case and I was assisted by Attorney Jack H. Young of Jackson. And we were both accorded, so far as attorneys are concerned, the same treatment as we received any place else in the courtroom by the court officials. Did you see any indication of undue hostility or any indication that there might be violence uh, in connection with this case? Well, frankly, I didn't uh, notice or observe any indication that there would be at that time. However, prior to that, the county attorney uh, stated that it would be hazard to bring him there for preliminary hearing. When Jess tells the story, uh, he was conveying that the judge was likely aware that there would be a lynching, that Mac Charles Parker would probably be taken from jail and lynched, which was not unusual in the South in those days. It was a, a part of what, what we lived with in the, in the uh, 40s and 50s and into the 60s. Early on, there were a lot of things going on, boycotts. Uh, the leaders in every community would get arrested. We had to get them out on bond. Uh, I didn't know how to do that, just did. I do remember that, them traveling together to these different places, arguing cases. They would ride together. They would leave maybe about 4 o'clock or so in the mornings. My dad would always have his briefcase, 
and he'd have a lunch box, a lunch that my mother had packed for him, you know, the night before, because there were very few places where black people could eat, you know, in these small towns. And he would also have, they'd have a typewriter on the back seat in case they needed to type some documents and so forth and so on. One of the stories I heard about uh, Jess Brown in, in court was the fact that he knew uh, this particular judge had nothing good for black people and his client. And he told the young black lawyer with him, so now I'm gonna raise this issue uh, and the judge is gonna go absolutely crazy and throw me out. But it's gonna also get my, uh, get another judge on the case uh, because of how he gonna act with me. And lo and behold, just raised some issues with the judge. Judge got mad, threw him out, made all kind of reversible error. And, and, and lo and behold, he ended up with another judge after the appeal and his client got off. But he spent a night in jail. Megger would uh, refer people to my father for legal assistance. He would refer clients to my dad and they would travel together, sometimes to different small towns, you know, where these clients lived. And I remember after he was assassinated in his driveway, I remember my dad saying that um, one thing that Megger had told him is that one time when he dropped him off after a trip, he said, you know, Jess, the only place I feel safe is at home. I knew at a fairly early age that he was involved in some controversial cases, you know, but I didn't know all the, you know, ins and outs about it. But when I really paid attention was when he started defending the Freedom Riders. When the Freedom Riders started coming to Mississippi in 1961, he was working very hard day and night, day and night, because there were so many of them coming in, trying to handle the cases. With the influx of out-of-state civil rights people coming to Mississippi, uh, and just the sheer number of people getting locked up, that in itself, created a real difficulty. We would sit there and the court would come into the COPO office. 300 in Meridian, 400 in Hattiesburg, all over the state, mass arrest. Now look, can I understand something? People are human. You know what it means to have a family and three children who you're supposed to be home with to give some food and you're sitting in the damn jail? Now stop to think what it means. People can be terribly courageous, but what? A fear begins to set in. The most important <laughs> thing that uh, the, the, those people who actually got and put their lives on the line, uh, the first school desegregation suit was brought by Meg Edwards, and he was killed. Uh, and then, then uh, uh, Gilbert Mason, uh, and I, I think they bombed his house one time. Uh, and then it was uh, uh, Aaron Henry. Uh, his, obviously his wife was fired from her role as a teacher in the school district. Um, the, uh, the Hudsons in Leake County, uh, who had to sit up with their guns all night to, uh, keep from getting bombed. They, 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 I think their house was bombed at one time. Just the courage of the order, I mean, Ms. Ms., oh, Ms. Hamer, uh, Ms. Maybertha Carter of my school desegregation plaintiffs who wanted their children to have a better education and whose names were up on the telegram post and who were shot at and bombed and threatened in every way. They were the best role models anybody could ever have. 
My dad never showed that he was fearful, never even talked about it. We did receive phone calls about people saying they're gonna bomb our home. I remember he was handling one case and he had received a telephone call saying, if you show up for court, we will kill you. My dad showed up and went on and did right where he went on and argued his case. So he was that kind of person. He focused on what he had to do. And in the 50s, you know going in that there will be no one who looks like you and your client in the jury or on the bench. It was, it was a tough job to be in, uh, to, 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 for a black person to be a lawyer <laughs> in the 60s and the 50s. It was a tough job. I had one judge call me a nigger. He didn't call me, he asked me, nigga, where you going? Uh, and that hurt me so bad because I was handling a divorce case for Mr. Young. <laughs> and uh, he knew this judge and he didn't want to go over there, so he sent me over there and it caught me by surprise. Uh, for a while I carried my diploma with me because uh, a couple of judges wouldn't take my word that I was a lawyer. And it was when I saw mass arrests, and there were three black lawyers, none of whom had gone to law school, bless their hearts, but they'd studied law. Um, and uh, there were three black lawyers and 900,000 black folk. Um, and most white lawyers didn't take any black cases that certainly didn't pay. Um, and so um, that got me through law school um, and I knew where I'd go. And so what happened was it was national groups that came to the rescue that sent whole, you know, cadres of lawyers to Mississippi to help. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Constitutional Law Center, all of these groups uh, established offices right there on Ferris Street in Jackson. We wound up dividing responsibilities. The school desegregation work was primarily the responsibility of the Legal Defense Fund. The uh, Lawyers Constitutional Defense Committee, which was right across the street on Ferris Street, took on prisoner cases and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law which was a few blocks the other end of Farris Street, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law took on the political cases. So we divided responsibilities up. The political accomplishments of the, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law are well known. They, all of the cases uh, to eliminate discrimination in voting, Frank Parker, who worked at that office, we lost him, he died. Uh, at a very young age, brought the uh, litigation to eliminate discrimination in polling, and he backed a number of the candidates that became the first black elected officials in the modern history of Mississippi. If had it not been for Frank Parker's ability to understand uh, the impor importance of the Voting Rights Act and how you apply it, uh, a lot of us wouldn't be elected today. When the Lawyers Committee came in, when the Lawyers Constitutional Defense Committee came in, and we had a number of lawyers who started to come to Mississippi as a, as a frontier. It, the, the resistance continued it, certainly through the 60s. Second year as governor of this great state, why we had a lot of attention paid to us that year, the Freedom Riders came to see us. You remember that? Thousand of Freedom Riders. And I got on television and I told the people to treat them with every courtesy, as long as it didn't violate our laws. But I said, when they start violating our laws, put every one of them in jail. And you know, Alan, you did that.
And you know, you know, when all the jails in Jackson were filled and Alan Thompson's chicken coops were filled on the fairground, there were 32 of them left, and I entered an executive order sending them to Parchman, the state penitentiary, to put them in maximum security cells where they stayed from three to four months, and you haven't heard any more from Freedom Riders, have you? If you could have seen the way black people were treated, it was just horrendous. My name is Willie Long, and uh, I was arrested Monday, um, Monday about noon for demonstrating too. I was over in the boys' side where they uh, separated the white boys from the color, and um, they had us all packed against the wall but we couldn't stretch our legs, um, move our arms, uh, when we would catch cramps and things like that. We couldn't, we couldn't use the restroom, we couldn't get in the water without they say so. Later I was carried to the hospital and, and had eight stitches taken in my head. Uh, another person was beaten by the same policeman. Stitches were taken in his head and he was kicked while he was laying on the ground after he was uh, struck with a club. It was a gruesome scene. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it myself. It has been my opinion in the past, and it's my belief today, that these marches, or assemblies, or demonstrations, or parades, or gatherings, or anything they are called, will accomplish nothing. There has not been any proven instance of police brutality, but it is something that they like to talk about when they break the law. There are no justifiable complaints here. One of the strategies for, for defending uh, persons who were involved in the civil rights movement uh, was to, when, once they were arrested, to have their cases removed to the federal court under a law that was passed uh, back at the turn of the century. And that's, that's one of the, the strategies that, uh, that local council and council from outside of the state uh, would use in order to get a fair uh, trial for whatever these persons were accused of. A law review article, which was cited by the Supreme Court of the United States, it was related to removing cases from state courts where we couldn't get a fair trial to the federal court. And this gave us time, gave us time to correct our forces. And this is when the out-of-state lawyers started coming in. In the very beginning, out of state lawyer, even though he was a lawyer, he could not, he could not uh, practice. We would have to take him to court, you know what I mean, and introduce him, and uh, then he would, uh, you know, would have his say. But just three, three, three lawyers, you know, we couldn't think lawyers all over the state. <laughs> So you see how we were, were ill men, and it took some time. The demonstrations and the, and the, and the protests did work. Uh, it, it galvanized a, a large segment of, of the country uh, as a whole. It broke the spirit of, of apartheid that, that we had in the state of Mississippi. What the country as a whole saw uh, on television basically led to the passage of, uh, of the Civil Rights Acts of the 60s. We don't intend to flagrantly go out to violate um, real laws designed to protect all citizens of the city. We just intend to test those which are discriminatory. We shall be 
engaged throughout the, uh, the days to come in very intensified community organization in order that our people may be informed of all of their rights as they um, are guaranteed under the Civil Rights Act and passed by the Congress over the last uh, few years. Well, it, it, by that time, by 1968, as you pointed out, uh, there, there had been a congressional action, <laughs> there had been executive action. Uh, it was a lot, lot easier uh, to navigate when you've got a, a, uh, a Voting Rights Act, you've got, uh, you, you have a Fair Housing Act. We had tools that, that, that the lawyers didn't have before I got here, so we, we, we used them. We used those tools for, in terms of getting people to go out and test uh, housing uh, issues. It, 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 it gave us more than the lawyers before us had to work with. The white power structure of Mississippi was overconfident that it had its, quote, Negros, unquote, in the state of such fear that none would dare to file a lawsuit in Mississippi. I believe that the civil rights successes that we achieved in the 50s and 60s could not have happened but for the role of lawyers uh, in helping to make them happen. Now, lawyers were a, a helping role, uh, but a necessary role because our society is one based on the rule of law. We, that's how it's done in America. And so both changing the law, getting rid of Jim Crow, defeating apartheid as a legal structure uh, happened in the courts. Uh, and had to be enforced in the courts, uh, but also could not have happened but for the passion and the activism and the, the willingness to put real lives on the line uh, to go to court, to take the actions, to insist on the rights uh, that lawyers could help enforce. I hope that the role of civil rights lawyers here in Mississippi has served as a foundation to ensure full participation of, of all people in our systems of government, uh, education, uh, the legal system, um, and, and other aspects of life. There were problems all over the country. <laughs> this was not, this was not exclusive to Mississippi or to the Deep South. Uh, but that still, if you were going to go to law school and be a lawyer, there was going to be real opportunity in Mississippi to make a difference, to to take those cases to court and to get some decisions that were going to have lasting impact, not just for the South but really nationally. On the success or failure of a movement, whether it's the one going on right now or the one that occurred when I was embedded in it. It's all about coalitions. You must find friends when you're outside looking in. Every single civil rights movement in America has involved white and black together. And anytime you fail to do that, you're putting hurdles in your way that you're not going to be able to overcome. Mississippi was fortunate enough to have three homebred lawyers and a whole lot of lawyers from around the country who came to Mississippi and just made enormous sacrifices. The role of lawyers was to protect the rights of individuals and to do what's right. What was required was the direct legal intervention of the people themselves, of the black movement themselves, with their own lawyers. 